Welcome to the first year lecture for 2020. My name is Richard Page. I am the Associate Dean for Undergraduate Studies in the College of the Liberal Arts. Today we'll, we'll also be joined by Bill Hessert, who is the college's uh, Director of Strategic Communications. It is my pleasure to introduce this year's lecturer, Jill Wood, Teaching Professor of Women's, Gender, and Sexuality Studies. Dr. Wood earned her doc doctorate from Penn State University in biobehavioral health with a minor in women's studies. Her research focuses on women's health, and she also has a research interest in feminist pedagogy. This semester, she is teaching an undergraduate course on women's health with a focus on black women's health and a graduate course on feminist pedagogy. In addition, this year, Dr. Wood received the George W. Atherton Award for Excellence in Teaching. The Atherton Award recognizes excellence in undergraduate teaching and is awarded each year to six faculty members at Penn State. Please welcome one of Penn State's finest, Jill Wood. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for showing up to listen in today. This is a strange time, right? I mean, if I asked you to describe the last six months in one word, we're probably not going to hear a lot of as expected or pretty normal. So I want to acknowledge the context, the space and the time that we are all in right now here together. This experience of this time as a first year student now in this unprecedented time. It's a shared moment. Never before has an incoming class found themselves in this situation. Beginning college is a transitionary time that coincides with civil unrest across our country as individuals demand racial justice. And simultaneously, we are in the midst of a global public health threat. This is a lot at one time. I see you. And here's what I know. There is so much to be hopeful about. This year will be unlike anything that most of us have ever experienced. You'll build memories here this year that you'll never forget. In fact, you'll build your own path through this year. And I strongly urge each of you to be active, engaged, and intentional in how you navigate this time in your life. So today, I'll talk about your path here in the College of Liberal Arts with regards to two concepts that I hope will be helpful tools for you. Mindfulness and mindset. But first, let's agree to start together. If we approach this semester from a shared perspective, that we're a community in this together, that's our best strategy as we learn together in this uncertain time. And because we're all here together in unusual times, I'm going to give an unusual talk. But first, let me start by telling you a little bit more about myself. You know that I'm a teaching professor here in the Department of Women's Gender and Sexuality Studies. I study women's health and sexualities and feminist and critical pedagogies, which is an elaborate way of explaining that I study the art of teaching and learning, especially in terms of how some folks have less access and less power in educational settings. For me, education matters because it has the potential to be transformative in people's lives, especially in the lives of marginalized people. I'm also a yoga teacher and a mama to three kiddos, and you'll probably hear all of these different parts of myself as I talk with you today. In all of these parts of my life, as a professor, a mama, a yogi, I have found that being mindful of how I show up in my life has allowed me to create my own path. 
one that is fulfilling and brings me meaning and joy. Your path will be different than mine and your path will likely change. But you're on a path, whether you see it now or not. And so my talk today is about being aware of how your actions and inactions create your life. And with awareness and intention, how you can carve out a path here and later that is fulfilling and brings you joy and meaning as well. So here's how we'll start on this journey. And I know this is gonna sound strange. Let's close our eyes. And if that doesn't feel comfortable, just have a nice, soft, easy gaze down at the floor. See if you can start to notice your breathing. See if as you inhale, you can imagine sending your breath through 360 degrees of your belly. See if on your exhale, you can equally press both feet into the floor in front of you. Sit up nice and tall and proudly without noticing your breath, without changing your breath, see if you can notice how it feels in your body. Is it shallow and quick, slow and deep? See if you can just notice it without judging it as good or bad. On your next breath, deepen your inhale. Imagine that on your inhale, you can grow up longer and taller through the crown of your head. Good, on your next breath, see if you can lengthen your exhale, seeing if you can make it slower and longer than your inhale. Keep breathing like that with deep, full inhales and long, slow exhales. Good. Now place one hand on your heart and one hand on your belly. Notice if as you breathe, you can feel your hands move, maybe on the inhale or the exhale or maybe both. How does your breath feel now compared to when we started? How do you feel now compared to when we started? Maybe you feel a little silly or that what I'm asking to do is weird or uncomfortable. I get it. Let's acknowledge that there will be many times during your time here in college when you feel that way, maybe a little silly or a little awkward or a little embarrassed. It's okay. It's critical for us to learn how to foster resiliency and a sense of being grounded in ourselves, even in times of discomfort. Especially right now, uncertainty is to be expected. Uncertainty is actually the constant right now. How we react to discomfort and change, that's up to us. So how do we do that? Let's give the breathing exercise another try. So go ahead and name whatever feelings or reactions you have. For example, say to yourself, I have some awkwardness, or I feel afraid of acting silly, or whatever it is. Allow your feelings and your reactions to be whatever they are, yet don't let them prevent you from being open-minded. The lesson here is that if we can find some space to witness how we arrive in a moment, feeling awkward, for example, 
then we actually have more freedom in how we choose to react. So let's try this again. Let's stay with our breath here. Consider closing your eyes if you didn't try it the first time. Connect to your inhale. And then notice your exhale. Think of as you breathe, you can slow your exhale. Make it a little bit longer than your inhale. When we do that, it's a little bit of a hack for our nervous system. And we can start sending our body signals that we are. So stay here with your breathing and my voice. And if you feel silly or uncomfortable, label that feeling as silly or uncomfortable. And then let it pass. Keep breathing. Just notice what pops up in your mind and let it sail past, letting it go as easily as it arrived. Now notice what's underneath your reactions. Keep digging and breathing. Keep sending away your own self-judgment and your own inner critic. Keep breathing. Eventually you'll arrive at your center. You'll know that you've arrived here when you feel something like home, calm, peace, ease. This place is your center. It's your inner voice. This is how you discover your own path. This place you're in right now, this version of you, right here, you are being mindful. When we slow our breath, we can be more in the present moment. And when we are present, we are able to really listen to the best version of ourselves. You can practice mindfulness simply by using your breath. And my best and biggest piece of advice is to visit here often and to make your most important decisions from this place. Mindfulness is a practice, meaning that it's something we do and it takes practice to do it. In this way, we could view our current uncertainty in these times as opportunities to practice, practice mindfulness. Because when we feel awkward or scared or uncomfortable, we can get under these initial reactions to see what we need, to understand what decisions we can make for ourselves to take good care of what we need. Plus, when we are mindful, we can extend kindness and compassion to ourselves. And by doing so, we have more kindness and compassion to extend to others. In this way, we can use mindfulness to change our mindset and our mindset to help our practice of mindfulness. If your eyes are closed still, go ahead and flutter them open now. Let's double click on this idea of mindset as a concept to understand how it relates to finding your own path here in liberal arts at Penn State. Mindset describes how you show up in your life. And as we've just experienced, using some mindfulness practices can help us act from our best selves instead of from reactionary places. In fact, I'll suggest that in order to get the most out of your education, we must be mindful of our mindset because how we show up in life changes how life goes. Let's consider the wise words of poet and feminist scholar Adrienne Rich and her convocation address to students at Douglas College in 1977. We'll share some slides with you so you can read along with me. For some context, 
Douglas College was an all women's college at Rutgers. And in this speech, Rich urges women to take responsibility for their own education, to claim it, in fact. She says, quote, the first thing I wanna to say to you who are students is that you cannot afford to think of being here to receive an education. You will do much better to think of being here to claim one. One of the dictionary definitions of the verb to claim is to take as the rightful owner, to assert in the face of possible contradiction. To receive is to come into possession of, to act as a receptacle or container for, to accept as authoritative or true. The difference is that between acting and being acted upon. He continues, I want to suggest that there is an essential experience that you owe yourselves, one which finally depends on you and all of your interactions with yourself and your world. This is the experience of taking responsibility towards yourselves. Responsibility to yourself means refusing to let others do your thinking, talking, and naming for you. It means learning to respect and use your own brains and instincts, hence grappling with hard work. Responsibility to yourself means that you don't fall for shallow and easy solutions, pre-digested books and ideas, weekend encounters guaranteed to change your life, taking gut courses instead of ones you know will challenge you, bluffing at school and life instead of doing solid work. The difference between a life lived actively and a life of passive drifting and dispersal of energies is an immense difference. Once we begin to feel committed to our lives, responsible to ourselves, we can never again be satisfied with the old passive way. I agree with Rich. You cannot afford to sit passively by in your educational pursuits. Much like in 1977, entire groups of people are still denied access to the education that is before you. We as a community, a culture, a country, we cannot afford to sit idly by in these times. Uncertainty now is the constant. It's knowable. Things will change. We will feel unsettled. And we need to practice over and over and over again how we want to show up in life. We can develop a mindset that sets us up for success if we begin with claiming education as a tool that is rightfully yours, your liberal arts education will prepare you to read and think critically about social problems, to bring empathy and passion to problems that need to be solved as we create more just communities. You will be challenged intellectually, socially and ethically to consider perspectives that are different than your own. Claim these opportunities to challenge yourself as gifts instead of as drudgery. Be active in your pursuit of groups, clubs, classes, professors, friends, and books that ignite your own passions. Know that opportunities will less often fall in your lap then you will need to go claim them for yourself. Be brave and kind and use your own voice to advocate for yourself and for others. If you don't know what you're passionate about yet, that's okay. Envision the world that you want to live in and do that. Keep an open mind and try out new things. Your liberal arts education will offer you many different perspectives, new ways of knowing, and will challenge you to even unlearn some assumptions 
that you might not be aware you even have. You will be asked to move outside of your comfort zone. You decide what's right for you. Quiet your mind, use your breath, get to your center and check in with yourself. Ask if, will I be proud of this decision tomorrow? And then trust yourself that if you make decisions from the best part of you, that you are doing the best you can. So how does claiming an education, mindset, and mindful, mindfulness coalesce? Here's some practical advice. Claim your education by taking personal responsibility for yourself. Do this in all of your communications with your advisors, your professors, your RA, your roommates, your family, your friends. I have some slides that we can review because I know sometimes we want practical advice. So as you consider your mindset, think about how you can be your best self. Be aware of what you're bringing to a conversation, to a class, or to an experience. If your mindset is less than ideal, we've all been there, we've all had a bad day, we've all been in a bad mood, and that's all okay, it's allowed. Be kind to yourself and be honest with others when you're not in a good space to make important decisions. This might mean giving yourself time and space and breathing to get back to yourself. This might take a whole day. Avoid using alcohol, drugs, and sex as a quick fix to feel better. They actually sabotage your ability to know yourself. Be community-minded and of service to others in your interactions. Think about others and how their experience might be different than yours. Approach these differences with a non-judgmental curiosity. Listen to others in order to truly understand and not just to respond. Be attentive and thoughtful in your written communication, especially in your email interactions with faculty. Your communication reflects who you are as a student and as a person. For example, reread emails and texts before you send them. Ask yourself if you're representing yourself well. Ask for help when you need it and take responsibility for your request. This means, for example, approaching a professor with request for help or an accommodation without entitlement or the assumption that something is owed to you. For example, if I'm a student and I'm ill and I want to ask for an extension on a paper, think through how I could write that email in a way that is worded to optimize my success. Optimize your success in all the ways you can. Set up a study schedule. When you study, consider it important work. Turn off all of your distractions. I know that sometimes we think we can have notifications in the background, or maybe you want to listen to music. I promise you that none of us can effectively multitask. Be kind and grateful in your communication with others so that they can extend the same gesture of kindness to you. Kindness really matters. I expect that your education here will be transformative. It may also sometimes be uncomfortable. That's okay. That's learning. It will challenge you and you may feel vulnerable in this learning. It's okay, I do too. Remember that your mindset is yours to control. You get to decide how you show up in your life. Remember that mindfulness 
being aware of how you show up is a practice and it takes practice. Your best self is always in you and you can get back to yourself using your breath, some quiet, maybe your favorite treat, some space away from distractions. So I welcome you, class of 2024, to the College of Liberal Arts at Penn State. Please reach out to me if I can support you or cheer you on. My email is jmw193 at psu.edu. You can ask me questions after this and also on the Canvas discussion board. I sincerely thank you for your diligence in mask wearing and following campus guidelines to keep one another as safe as possible during this time. My colleagues and I are delighted to have you here. We have high expectations for your learning. We have a new, more just version of this community and this country to create. Here in liberal arts, we are making a difference. Welcome. I think Bill is gonna help, help me field questions now. I am indeed. Thank you, Dr. Wood, for that, for that informative and mindful presentation. That is wonderful advice um, for all of us to have. I really appreciate it. Um, before we jump into the questions, uh, just a reminder to everybody who's listening that if you are welcome to submit any questions that you have, all you need to do is, if you scroll to the bottom of your Zoom screen, you will see a Q&A button. Um, please feel free to submit any questions you have there and we will uh, get to them as, as we can. We have about a half hour, up to a half hour for questions, so we welcome any questions you might have. Um, Dr. Wood, one of the first questions that we, we received was, um, this is this has all been wonderful advice on how we can try to be our best selves and to be mindful ourselves. What advice do you have for folks who are confronted by people who aren't reciprocating that? How can you try to be your best self when others are not necessarily being mindful at the same time? That's a great question, right? Because if we were all kind of using the same practice or acting out of our best selves, we, we, we would have an easier time here. So I think one thing that I wanna make sure I say is, this is my advice to everyone in my world. This is not just to students, this is to um, colleagues of mine who are faculty members, this is to my own children, this is to people in the grocery store who are not being kind. Um, as I feel able to do so, I, I try to ask, you know, are you having a hard time? Is there something that I could help you with? Um, because otherwise, you know, if you're pushing me out of the way to get milk and there's plenty of milk. Well, I'll get the milk. So, <laughs> so, I mean, I guess I'll say one thing, please know this isn't just advice for students. This is hopefully advice for all of us being our best selves in the world. Um, so two things come to mind. First is this idea of trying to not react to discomfort. And it sounds like in this question, if someone is being hateful or disrespectful, that's really challenging to not act out of or in reaction to hate. I think that is one of our greatest learning opportunities is how we can connect to who we want to be in that interaction. Um, I blow it off and I screw it up instead of being kind and mindful and thoughtful, I might say something reactionary and mean. Um, and then I get the chance to, to back up and apologize and take responsibility. So I guess a couple things, know that we all get more than one chance at this over and over and over. Sometimes we'll make mistakes and learn from them. Um, if I got to be my best self all the time, then if someone said something hateful or disrespectful to me, I would be able to say to myself, right, in this kind of how we, our inner voice and how we talk to ourselves, I think is so much more important than how others speak to us. And I always tell myself, tell my kids, the way you're talking to yourself 
it's often not as kind as it is in terms of how you talk to someone else you love. So when I kind of had us look at our inner critic and how we judge ourselves, please be sure that if someone else is being hateful and disrespectful, that you replace that inner voice with something that is loving and kind and builds you up, right? Lots of other people will try to break us down, but you, you, you get to have the voice at the end of the day. Great, thank you very much. That's, that's great advice. Um, we, we had one person uh, comment to us that, that you, you are such a positive person and this all seems to, to come to you so naturally. And, and, and they were curious to know, was there a time in your life that this didn't come naturally? And then how did you get to the point where it, it became uh, a, a mindful practice that, you could, that, that became more natural for you? Well, I, I appreciate that observation and I'll tell you that it means I'm faking it really well because just, <laughs> I think a lot of us are faking it really well, right? Like fake it till you make it or something. Um, I, I, I do try to be my best self in all the places in my life and I often don't get it right. I will scream at my kids or I'll say something that just isn't as kind as I would hope. So um, just this morning I had you know, an opportunity to ask myself if I really wanted to be speaking the way that I was to um, one of my children who looked right at his lunchbox and said, where's my lunch? And I said, where have you looked? <laughs> so um, I think what I like about this idea of practice is that we, we, get to, we get a chance to do it better or do it right or do it differently every time, every day. And so you know, I started off today, it was kind of a yucky, rainy day here, and I felt kind of low energy. Then I taught a grad class, and we had such a great class, and I said to them all, boy, I really appreciate your energy and your thoughtfulness, like you have energized me today. So thanks for the feedback. I, I think I do try to be positive. I do try to frame things in terms of how can I make this better, but I also feel like we all have bad days and that doesn't mean you're doing something wrong. It just means you get another chance tomorrow. Great, thank you. Um, in terms of, of trying to practice mindfulness, um, in terms of maybe scheduling times throughout the day, do you have any recommendations? Um, do you try to find times for yourself specifically that each day I'm going to say, I'm going to commit to finding a certain time during the day to do this or is it depending on the situations and the stresses you might be feeling or a combination of both that's a great question i would probably say a combination of both there are times in my life where i have done for instance like the 30-day meditation challenge which is only something a type a academic would do right is to challenge yourself to meditate every day for 30 days um but sometimes that's kind of how we have to get to those things is to do it in whatever way it shows up as doable. So sometimes I have done that. I really like, there's some really good mindfulness apps on your phone. I really like Insight Timer. There's some other ones. I know CAPS this morning, just in the Penn State email, CAPS had a great story link that you could go um, find some resources that they're offering students. For me, I'll be honest, when I'm having a hard time and feeling overwhelmed, going outside changes everything for me. So I have a dog, I, I go for walks, even if no one in my house wants to go for a walk, I make them put their sneakers on and we go for a walk and we always end up coming back to the house in a different mindset. And so sometimes it's not something you can force, right? You just have to literally get a different perspective. I will also say that this could go to the other question too about being positive or um, trying to be active in your own life is that I have really come to see the own limitations that I have. When I was a little bit younger, I didn't, I didn't need to sleep or I didn't need to make sure I was eating well. I didn't need to make sure I was going outside. And I started to get really run down and I just felt really like I was beating myself up a lot. Like I was, kind of doing everything 110% all the time. And I'll say that at some point I just realized that wasn't sustainable for me. And I know that you're all much younger than I am. And so you might feel like 
you don't have to sleep enough or eat well. And I promise you that you do because our bodies are so strong and they have so much possibility in them. But really what we put in them in terms of good food and enough water and enough sleep, like we can't create things if we're not putting good stuff in. So um, I think that I try to remind myself um, if I'm not feeling great, if I'm feeling run down or overwhelmed or anxious or sad, like, Jill, have you had enough water to drink today? Did you sleep enough? Sleeping enough is not six hours. That's not enough sleep. Some people need eight hours, but six hours is not enough for any of us. Um, so I think those things all too, I'm really aware that they're not negotiable. I have to frame them as ways I take care of myself because otherwise I have a lot of things that I could say, this is really important. Maybe I should do this instead of going to bed. And I have to go to bed. Well, this is actually a, a good follow-up question, uh, especially regarding sleep. Uh, because something that I notice sometimes is that at the end of the day, and it's time to, to go to bed and, and try to rest, that your mind is racing like crazy, thinking about something that happened during the day or something that you have to do the next day. Um, and obviously trying to get to the point where you're, you're breathing and trying to get more into that mindful state, that's where we want to get. But, but how do you calm down those voices that are in your head to help even get to that point where you can start doing that? That's also a great question. Um, in yoga, we call that mind that's spinning, we call it the monkey mind. Um, so, which is right, because it's like, you can have a thought about like, oh, is it gonna rain tomorrow? Like, oh, my raincoat, oh my gosh, should I leave my raincoat there? Oh, I'm hungry, right? Like we spin, spin, spin. And so there's a couple things happening when our minds do that. I think that our minds are really trying to tell us we need to brain dump. So like, I will write something down, I'll send myself an email, I'll try to listen to what that voice is telling me. And if it's something important, I listen. But sometimes for me, it's like, it's almost like my mind is looking for something to do. And so that's when it starts spinning. And so in that case, what ends up happening is that our bodies physiologically start to have a reaction to everything we're imagining. So even if we didn't lose our raincoat or we're not, or we know we have enough money you know, for lunch tomorrow, we start to react as if our thoughts are real. And so there's this distinction between a thought as a fact and a thought as a feeling. So one tip is to just see if when our mind's doing that, try to grab onto something, give it something to grab onto that's calming. Give it something to grab onto that's positive. If that's not happening, I always kind of say, try your breath. And it's, it might sound like a little um, frou-frou-y, but there is this magic in breathing in terms of how it calms down our nervous system. And so when we use that trick I talked about where we have our exhale be longer, what that does is that it kind of hacks our nervous system. And a long exhale does a couple things. First of all, we start regulating how much oxygen our breath, our brain is getting and all of our muscles, right? We start making sure we're sending oxygen to places that need it. But we also, when we lengthen our exhale, we start to slow our heart rate. When we slow our heart rate, we also start to release less cortisol, which is the stress hormone. When we release less cortisol, we slow our heart rate even more. And so it really kind of is this a little bit magical um, feedback loop in which we can control how our mind talks to our body. That doesn't mean that it's going to work every time. And if it's not working, it doesn't mean you're doing it wrong. It might mean try something else. So maybe for you, that is, for me, I'll also say it's like moving distractions out of where I'm trying to go to sleep. So if you're someone who is struggling with sleeping, um, turn off your screens up to an hour before you go to bed. Again, there's something just magical about how those electronics change our brain 
And especially because most of us are on our phone or our tablet, when we have like 17 things up, right? And we have like notifications and music and email, our brain is just busy trying to manage all of that. So if we can stop and give our brain a break before bed, our brain will start to come to be able to slow down enough to sleep on its own. Great advice, thank you. Um, actually gonna change gears a little bit with some of, some of the questions. Um, we had somebody ask, um, knowing that, that you are a, an award-winning teacher uh, with, with the college and the university, congratulations on that award, by the way. Um, what is it about teaching that you enjoy the most or why do you enjoy teaching? That's a great question. Um, and what a great honor for me because we have fantastic teachers in the College of Liberal Arts. Um, so I consider myself very honored to have been, to have, uh, been awarded that. So for me, what I love about teaching, I'll say, I'll say two things. And one is, I call it that light bulb moment or that aha moment. And it's, it happens in a classroom, usually in a discussion, but sometimes in office hours or now in Zoom, on the Zoom call, right? Where a student is exposed to something or like gets something in this way that makes a huge difference for them. And so because I, I do a lot of teaching about health and sexuality, a lot of times I'm teaching information that has real life implications for students like in that moment for them. And so sometimes, often, it's that we don't have the information to make good decisions about our bodies. And so sometimes being able to share that information in a way that a student can feel more comfortable to hear it or can ask questions or that they're able to feel like they have permission to act in their own lives. For me, that it's like fireworks. I mean, I get to witness students start becoming agents in their own life around their bodies or their health. And that's like such a fantastic opportunity for me. Um, I often get to know students well in a couple different classes and then they'll keep in touch with me. And so now I have been teaching, I think next year I'm at 20 years here. So I have students now who are having babies and sending pictures of, um, you know, what their childbirth was like and saying, you know, I learned something about your class and I thought of you. I don't know if you remember me. And I remember all of them. And so for me, I just have the best job in the whole world. I mean, um, I interestingly, when I came, uh, when I started college, I, I wanted to be a physician and I um, had an opportunity to teach as a graduate student and I just felt like this is it, I'm home. Um, I gave up a pretty cushy research assistantship and, and, and asked to teach and um, have not regretted it for one second. That's wonderful. And you're also a Penn State alumna. I am. I am. Um, and, and so a, another question along those lines was what, what brought you to, to Penn State and what keeps you here at Penn State? Well, I will answer this very honestly. What brought me to Penn State were the chipmunks. I, um, I did not have chipmunks where we grew up. I mean, I had seen chipmunks, but the chipmunks and squirrels here, as you know, are very tame and very sweet. And I, my mother would probably describe me as a challenging teenager. So um, during the time of applying to college, we, you know, we looked at, we went and looked at all these colleges and I'm sure that it was like my mom and I butting heads about something, but she said like, Jill, you just have to make a decision about this. And, and I was feeling pressured and I said, okay, well I pick Penn State. And she said, why? And I said, because of the chipmunks. And so that was me, of course, being kind of a little bit of a bratty teenager. But um, for me, I felt like there was something about Penn State and the chipmunks that just really made me feel homey. I mean, I know some people are terrified of how aggressive the squirrels are, but my kids, you know, even um, before students came back, we go onto campus and we watch them and they play and it's kind of nice to me that after being here for so long, I have, I've left and come back, but 
they're, they're still kind of, it, it seems like a silly thing to say, but it's homey. Um, there was a second part of that question, Bill, I forgot it. Oh, what has kept me here? What keeps you here? What, what, what has kept you here? Right. Um, so I have um, taught and um, worked at other places. For me, one of the things about Penn State that's really irreplaceable is its beginnings as a land-grant university. And um, that when I first started teaching here, especially, I had so many interactions with students who were first generation college students. And for them, college was literally transforming their lives. And for me, every time I get to interact with a student who college for them isn't just an add on, but college for them really will change their life path. I feel like that's the place I want to be. Um, and so that's something that is special for me about Penn State. I think that there's this way in which at Penn State, education is expected to be powerful. And that's, that's close to me in my heart. Thank you. Um, this was actually a question that was posed to Dean Lang last week during the Meet the Dean uh, conversation. And although you've certainly um, given some great advice throughout your whole presentation, um, today about being mindful. Um, if you were to give one other piece of advice for a first year student beyond trying to practice mindfulness when they can, what would that be? That's a great question. And I, I was actually in that talk with Dean Lang. So I was expecting this question was going to be asking me about my pets, but I'm prepared for that as well. well we can answer that one as well then. I'll answer that one second. Okay. So, um, I would say, and this is not just my opinion, but backed up by a ton of really good research, that find someone on campus, or if you're virtual, find someone where you, you can connect with. Find someone who invests in you. That might be um, an instructor, an advisor. Um, find a way to connect with that person so that when you need help, when you need resources, you have someone to ask. I know that might seem intimidating to be a first year student and to try to build a relationship with someone, but that's really part of our jobs, right? Our, our job as instructors, as advisors is to be here for you. And I don't mean be here for you like, um, I'm going to suggest some meal planning for you, or I'm going to like knock on your door and remind you to do your homework. I'm not, we're not here for you in that enabling parenting kind of way. We're here for you and let us know how we can support you. What do you need? So if I have someone email me and say, um, I'm hoping you can help me. I, I love asking for help in a, such a straightforward, direct way. Because if I say um, to you, Bill, hey, I'm looking for some help. Can you help me? It's really hard for you to say no, right? Like most people are not going to say, nope, good luck. So start by asking for help in a direct way. Say, I just, I had three emails this week that were like this. And it was first year students who felt really overwhelmed. And they said, like, everything is different in each of my classes on campus. And I'm having a hard time figuring this out. And I'm afraid I miss things. And I could tell that they were kind of spinning and feeling, and they even said, I'm feeling really freaked out. I said, don't worry, it's normal to feel freaked out. Like, take a breath. We'll figure this out together. I said, here's my suggestion. Go through and read just these three pages of the syllabus. Come back to me. Let me know if that answered your question. So I think it's okay to ask for help. And if you don't get someone who says, yes, I'll help you, go to the next person. Like that's what rich means by claiming your education. You have amazing opportunities here. Look for how to find them. And if you can't find them, email me. I will help you find that answer, right? There's lots of us who are excited about your interest and your motivation. Second question is the my pets. I have a dog who I had to scooch out of here a little bit ago. His name is Mr. He's a little Boston Terrier. I also have six backyard chickens. Um, wow. 
Yeah, so um, our, we're a lovely family project. And I had lots of people say chickens are the most dirty, disgusting animals you'll ever have. And I didn't listen very well. And in fact, chickens are dirty and disgusting, but they all have names and they make us eggs. And uh, it's hard to be unhappy watching a chicken dig for worms. So that helps me in my positive outlook too. Great. Have you named the chickens? Do they have? Do they have? We have names? named the chickens. We have a wide variety of names. Um, Trixie is a chicken who does tricks for treats, and then we have Athena, who is kind of like a Greek warrior chicken. She looks like a hawk, and she does not care about anyone else but herself. And then we have like Tilly, who's like a grayish purple grandmother-looking chicken. So yeah, the kids all. Um, the kids all named the chickens. When we first got them, my youngest son is um, an avid carnivore. He loves eating meat, especially off the bones. When we got them, he said in front of my daughter, who is very sensitive, he said, when do we get to kill and eat them? So, <laughs> so lots, of, lots of different perspectives and different uh, sensitivities in my house. That's great. Uh, well, I, I think we are getting close to the end of our time. I uh, wanted to give you the opportunity if there was anything, any final comment that you would like to make uh, to the group for the good of the order, and then I can wrap some things up with a couple of housekeeping items. But give me the opportunity. The floor is yours if you would like it. Um, I appreciate everyone attending and listening. I know that you have a lot of demands on your time and that you are trying to figure this all out know that you'll figure it out, know that this is just a transition time. And in two weeks, you're gonna look back on this and realize how far you've come. So um, give yourself a pat on the back, keep advocating for yourself. And Kevin, I don't know if you can um, flash up my first slide with my email on that, but I really do invite people to email me if you have a question, if you wanna say hi, that's one of the nice things right now in Zoom time are that you have just as much access to contact me as someone who's in my person class. Oh so, yeah. There it is. That's all I've got. Thanks for okay. your questions. Thanks for moderating, Bill. Absolutely. And, and thank you for, uh, for your, uh, as I said before we started, your, your informative and your mindful presentation. I, I, I certainly took uh, things away from it as well. So I appreciate that. Um, just a couple of housekeeping items for the, the, the students who are still uh, with us um, that uh, we, we are recording this today and we will make this available um, through the college's uh, YouTube channel. Um, and uh, we'll, we'll share a link over our social media uh, channels as well. And this is going to be Part of a discussion on the canvas board next week i believe um and you're going to be joining them for that discussion is that correct jill so yes so forward to that um thank you everybody for your time today uh i hope uh your semester is going well so far and wish you well on your collegiate journey thank you everybody bye everybody <laughs>